What is wrong with teenagers? My gorgeous daughter, everyone. They're moody, they're rude, they make really stupid decisions and won't follow our sage advice. And surely today's teenagers are worse than they've ever been in the history of the whole world, right? <laughs> Maybe not. A few centuries ago, a guy named Plato lamented, what is happening to our young people? They disrespect their elders, they disobey their parents, they ignore the law, they riot in the streets inflamed with wild notions. Their morals are decaying. What is to become of them? And a few years later, a, the Greek poet Hesiod may have said, I see no hope for the future of our people if they are dependent on the frivolous youth of today. For certainly all youth are reckless beyond words. When I was young, we were taught to be discreet and respectful of elders, but the present youth are exceedingly disrespectful and impatient of restraint. So it seems we may not be the first generation to worry about our adolescents, but why? Why is adolescence such a difficult and worrisome time? Well, part of the answer to that question is obvious, hormones. That lovely flow of neurochemistry that makes girls cry and boys believe they're invincible. But there's a lot more to it than that. Let's start with the basic nature of brain development. Many of you may have heard that the human brain develops basically back to front. But what does that really mean? Well, it means that processing visual information happens really early, as do auditory processing and our sensory motor functions. Developing a sense of yourself as being separate from your parents also happens fairly early, around 18 to 24 months. Though this search for identity continues throughout life and plays a major role in adolescence. And the ability to respond emotionally that begins very early. So what does that leave for last? What brain functions are typically directed by those frontal lobes of the brain? Emotional regulation, critical thinking, problem solving, planning for the future, consideration of consequences, hypothetical and abstract thinking. Basically everything that makes a fully functional adult human. Luckily, all of these functions are online by the time a child enters high school, right? <laughs> okay. Well, we used to believe that the human brain was, on average, fully developed by about age 20. That would mean it's almost done wiring up in high school, and college seals the deal. But the more we learn about the brain, the better we understand that it is never fully developed. Our brains are always changing and adapting and developing new capabilities. But perhaps more significant for our discussion today, we've also realized that the brains of the net generation, this group of kids who have grown up in the modern digital age, seem to be, be developing more slowly than those of teens from previous years. Current estimates suggest that the age at which most people develop a fully functional adult brain ranges from about 25 to 35. And conversely, the average age of the onset of puberty is dropping dramatically. It's down to age 11 for both boys and girls. So this means that children are experiencing adolescence for two decades. It is truly a miracle that the boys survive. As painful as it is, put yourself back in your adolescent shoes for a few minutes and try to understand just how challenging being a teenager really is. Your body and brain are experiencing a flood of hormones that wreak havoc on your looks and even more so on your emotions. And unfortunately, the part of your brain that's most heavily involved in helping you reason through your emotions and manage your responses is not yet operational. Associated with these hormonal changes, teens experience what I lovingly call the twin devils. These are two developmental phenomena that dramatically impact adolescence. 
The first, the imaginary audience, is a strong belief that everyone is watching you and judging you at all times. The second is called the personal fable and represents the belief that no one in the history of the entire world has ever lived the life you're living and therefore no one understands you and what you're going through. In girls, this is often manifested in conversations with their mothers that sound something like, you don't know what it's like. <laughs> Meanwhile, boys firmly believe that jumping their dirt bikes over 18 semi-trailers won't kill them because the laws of physics don't apply to them. <laughs> so imagine walking around all day, every day, your head and body full of hormones, your emotions running amok with no guidance from the frontal lobes, firmly believing that no one in history has ever experienced what you experience. So you just have to fumble your way through. And everyone is watching you and judging you as you do it. Now pile on the countless expectations that we place on teenagers today. Eight different classes in which you must earn A's, weeks of standardized testing, and more extracurricular activities than ever before. Finally, let me clarify that very few people in this room fully understand what it is like to be a teenager in the digital age. I certainly don't. I may have believed that everybody was watching my mistakes, but it probably wasn't true. But today there's a cell phone in every pocket and myriad ways to upload video to the web in seconds. So that imaginary audience has become very real. And the rates of child and adolescent anxiety and depression are skyrocketing. This understanding of the reality of adolescence is staggering to me. I am honestly just so impressed that they can get out of bed in the morning. But I'm also beginning to realize how fully we are failing them. The brain is an amazingly adaptable organ that physically changes in response to what we ask it to do. Physically changes. Every new thing we learn, do, or experience changes the ways in which our brain cells interact and communicate with each other, effectively changing how we think and what we are capable of. So as we look at the life of a modern teenager, is it really any wonder that their development is delayed? What types of cognitive skills do standardized tests promote? What happens to a child's brain when she doesn't have time to engage in creative, unstructured outdoor play? And what is the impact of hours spent watching online videos or the constant stress that accompanies our always on society? We have built this world, not them. Many in the media have vilified technology, blaming it for the degenerate state of our adolescence. But I firmly believe that this is an old people problem. Today's teens have grown up with technology in their pockets and unsurprisingly, they've generally used it for entertainment. Why would they use it for anything else? It's not like many of their parents are actively showing them how to develop websites, make documentaries, analyze data, or establish personal learning networks. Most of us don't even know how to do these things. So we use technology for the same things our teens use it for, entertainment and social media. It's just how you use it. And our teens' brains certainly aren't saying, you should definitely use your cell phone as a tool for learning and higher order thinking, young man. But technology is capable of so much more. Its potential to enhance creativity, communication, collaboration, and critical thinking is almost boundless. And some teens are beginning to discover that potential. They make videos, advocate for social causes, invent 3D braille printers, and literally develop apps that diagnose brain cancer. This young man is 13 years old. Some of our greatest innovations have been discovered by individuals who were barely out of high school. So what makes the difference for those teens? Many have been exposed to adult mentors who showed them what technology is capable of, 
But really, the secret lies in that underdeveloped brain. While we often think of it as a liability, causing teens to make poor decisions and forget to turn in their homework, this lack of development is, in fact, beautiful. You see, our adult frontal lobes make us afraid. They inhibit our imaginations, make us reluctant to try new things and meet new people, and impose rules on our actions. Meanwhile, the teen brain is more fluid and flexible, allowing adolescents to be idealistic, bold, and creative. And this makes sense. Adolescence is preparation for adulthood. It's a chance for children to experiment with their identities and discover who they want to become. It is, in fact, their very lack of development that enables them to be brave enough to meet the challenges they face every day. And perhaps the delays we're seeing in the brains of today's teens are not entirely a bad thing. As our society has grown more complex, their brains have had to adapt. This delay then gives them time to explore the world and figure out their roles within it. What they need, what they crave, is guidance, opportunity, someone who understands the tremendous potential of the adolescent mind and is willing to take the time to mentor them. Who among us has sat with a teenager lately and shown him how to engage in scientific inquiry? Showed her how to code an app? And engaged him in studying a topic that is truly important? Or asked her what she thinks we should do to solve the world's greatest problems? They have the potential. They have the tools. The responsibility lies with us. We are the ones who can provide the opportunities and experiences that adolescents need to flourish. But it will require change. We must model what it looks like to have a technology life balance. Put down the cell phone, close the computer, and talk with a teenager one-on-one. -on -one. Show them what it looks like to disconnect to connect. Furthermore, we have to mentor teens in using technology to engage in learning, creativity, and higher order thinking. And if we don't know how to do those things, it's no longer OK to accept that. We have to step up and learn. If you don't know where to start, ask your kids, and you can learn together. But most importantly, we must stop criticizing teens as a group and embrace the beauty of this incredible period of development. Yes, they're impulsive and loud and pimply, <laughs> but they're also tremendously strong. We have to show them that we care, that we understand them, and above all, that we trust them to do great things. By doing so, we can help teens to shape their brains in ways that will amaze us. They will, in fact, save the world, just like they've always told us they would. Thank you.